Welcome, welcome everyone, my name is Sean, and today we gotta talk about the re-emergence of the knockout game, this time in Massachusetts, I believe that this one is in Boston, and how the media once again can't call it what it is. They once again just talk about teens, random violence, no discernible motivation, and all that other nonsense, despite the fact that we've seen this before, it continues to happen across this country, and they should just identify what's actually going on. And by the way, for those of you who are like, that's not a game, that's assault, that's not a game, that's attempted murder, I know that. But the point is, these people call it the knockout game, they play this game for fun, they're doing this for their own enjoyment, thus the name fits. But before we get into that, I want to say thank you to everybody. Sign up over on actualjusticeword.com slash join. I will give me the money. Give you give me the money. Okay. And thank you to the podcast listeners, Spotify, Apple, and Google's podcasting platform. So there are two local news segments that I'm going over today. Both of them, interestingly enough, have the comments turned off and they identify one of the victims of this attack. And by the way, it's actually a series of attacks as a mentally disabled person, because of course, these criminals, these thugs, these absolute animals ended up attacking somebody with a mental disability just for the fun, the enjoyment, the entertainment of it. And of course, during the course of some of these other attacks, they ended up stealing property, so that allows the media to kind of obfuscate who the perpetrators are, what the motivation was, and the fact that the knockout game does in fact exist. The police say that first attack happened just outside of this TJI Friday's restaurant. Investigators say a man was sitting on one of those stones waiting for his mom when police say out of nowhere he was attacked by a group of teens. So first and foremost, because this needs to be said, I, Sean Fitzgerald, owner and content creator of the actual Justice Warrior, I'm absolutely shocked and horrified that TGI Fridays still exist. I didn't realize that these kind of chain restaurants were still around, that they were in still major mall thoroughfares and whatnot. So let us all say that we are stunned by one aspect of this story, although it is not the aspect that the local news is trying to say is shocking, unpredictable, and not something we've ever seen before. Just says 30 year old male head injury after an assault. Dispatcher sending police to the TGI Fridays on Tremont Street in Mission Hill just after 1130 last Friday morning. Investigators say a man was waiting for his mom. He was attacked by a group of teens. Police believe these four were involved. So one of the things that I think is quite notable about this attack, it's actually very similar to the murder that we covered out of the Philadelphia Macy's, is that this occurred early in the morning, broad daylight. This was around 11.30, so close to noon, and this group of teens, totally undeterred by the fact that everybody can see what they're doing in public, that they're in a public mall during the Christmas shopping season, decided that they were going to target a disabled man that was waiting for his mother outside a stop and shop and a TGI Fridays. I would have never, especially here near Brigham Circle, never would have thought it would happen. Now look, I'm not a detective. I never went to detective school. I've never been a detective divisor or anything like that but i'm just gonna say there's a chance and by a chance i mean i'm just kidding do not sue me that this individual is actually this guy right there in the hoodie i'm not saying anything i'm just saying that maybe just maybe if only the people in the universe were in this local news segment i would be asking this guy questions no seriously just kidding about this but it is interesting to see the kids from in and around the area be shocked and horrified about the actions of kids that are in and around their own age, especially against a disabled person, especially in broad daylight. And again, you could see the backpack, which indicates we have a much younger man that we're dealing with, and it's absolutely crazy. Investigators say the man had shoe prints on his face and was bleeding. He told officers at least three teens started punching and kicking him for no reason. The attack caught on security camera. The man's mother telling police... That's another thing that often is not emphasized enough. It's not just the sucker punch. It's not just the cowardly nature of starting a fight when you have a numbers advantage and then starting that fight without even informing the other person that you're getting into a fight. Of course, these all lead off with the sucker punch, but it's the vicious nature in which they stomp this person out. 
Also, I want to point out that they're wearing COVID masks. Can we stop with these COVID masks in public? Can we identify this on young kids as people not concerned about COVID, but actually concerned about security cameras? It's super obvious. The attack caught on security camera. The man's mother telling police he is disabled and unable to defend himself. So the mom says that his disability prevents him from being able to defend himself. And again, it just goes to the absolute cowardice of these perpetrators and the absolute monstrous nature that they actually have. First and foremost, they attack somebody without informing him there's a fight. So it starts with the sucker punch because they're cowards. They do so with a number it's advantage. Why? Because they're cowards and they pick a target that is incapable of defending himself and they're stomping on his face to the point where there are shoe prints all over his face by the time that the police get there. Again, absolutely cowardly and they did this for entertainment. And by the way, nowhere throughout the course of this segment is there any word about a potential hate crime. We hear across this nation, anytime a white person says something, gets into an argument, even if they're justified in that argument, that their motivation, if they're arguing with a black person, is evil white racism and due to their evil white racism and how their speech crime should be categorized as evil white racism. But in this particular instance where you do a vicious attack for entertainment, you target somebody who's vulnerable who happens to be disabled, no word being spoken at all by anybody about this potentially being a hate crime. It's a little, like, frightening to know that there, there are kids that could be at my school even that are being violent. Listen, I'm not a detective, but I am somebody who will use the same joke over and over again. But one of these perpetrators was, in fact, a woman. This girl is saying that it could be scary that these kids might go to her very same school. So I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying if I were not a detective, I would point to this woman right here in the group and say maybe, just maybe, this is her. Now, I'm just kidding. Again, we're going off the premise that everybody in this whole world, this whole universe, exists in this local news segment, but I do find it interesting that there is a school nearby. This is likely where the perpetrators come from, and we should probably go after them at their school and find out where they were admitted, if there were surveillance cameras when they came in, so we could identify them based on their clothing or based on whatever, so that we could hold these people to account. Investigators say two hours later, police responded to a second attack. This time, a man was walking near Allegheny and Pontiac streets when he says a group of teens demanded his cell phone and began punching him until he was able to get away. He told officers his phone and earbuds were gone. Now, of course, these attacks come in waves, they come in sprees, and they come in variety. So this particular one was an attack with a robbery. Now, I'm not sure if there's surveillance video of the suspects from that attack, if they're able to tie the two together. But it seems rather interesting that this is all happening within hours of each other by a group of teens that are described similarly and they're attacking in a similar way, a group mob attack where they start the punch, they start the fight before informing the victim that there even is a fight and they just act in this completely and utterly cowardly way. But it's really surprising around here, it's all hospitals and elderly people, so you don't expect something like that. Later that night in the same area, police say a third attack by the teens on a man walking who was able to get away. And then there's a third attack on a man that's walking by. He's able to get away. And again, it's all in and around this area. So if the school isn't the central point, maybe one of these perpetrators lives in this particular area or they're just hanging out there for some reason that should be able to be identified by law enforcement. But the point is, this is in fact the knockout game. This is done for entertainment. The laughter, all of the hallmarks of the game are here. And I find it really interesting that we see some surveillance photos, but we don't see the vicious nature nature of the attack, despite the fact that the first one on the disabled person was at 1130 in the morning in front of all these places with surveillance cameras, and they acknowledge the existence of those surveillance cameras. Now, police say they were able to use security camera to track down another suspect. They say they spotted her walking nearby, and when they questioned her, they say she admitted to being involved in one of the attacks. Now, investigators are hoping someone recognizes the four teens in those photos and calls police. So we have another female, a fifth suspect that was stopped and questioned admits to being involved in at least one of the attacks. However, like I said, even though these are all in and around the same area, they all took place at the same day, there is a chance that maybe the late evening one is separated out from these other two due to the distance in terms of time. But yeah, they have one person, they're still looking for four, and I would think they would look at the school or something like that in order to figure out what's going on. Also, people in the area feel completely unsafe in that area, which makes sense because you have a soft-on-crime kind of area and these are the consequences
consequences of those policies. Also, you have people failing to call out what's actually going on. I never walked around here with a, a, a mace. Never. You, you know? So if, if I have to walk around here with this to protect myself, I'm going to walk around here. Monique Taylor is taking no chances after this group of teens allegedly carried out random attacks in Mission Hill last Friday. Now, it appears a week removed from this situation, they don't have any information on the suspects. They still haven't found them. And people in the community are taking precautions. This woman is carrying pepper spray. And by the way, I definitely recommend doing something like that in these particular areas, because if you can get somebody in the face with that pepper spray, especially these teens, they're going to back off. They're cowardly. The reason they sucker punch, the reason they attack people with disabilities, the reason they group up is because they're not expecting any resistance. They don't want to face any resistance. They're just trying to overwhelm with the maximum amount of force. Police said the teenagers attacked a disabled man, leaving him bloody with visible shoe prints on his face. There's something going on in our, with our youth today, and, and it, it needs to be addressed. Now, Monique also gives one of the more honest takes because the local news is not saying anything of substance of value that there is something going on with our youths. Note that she is a black woman. When she says our youths, she's seen the suspects. She knows what she's referring to and it needs to be addressed. And I couldn't agree more. One of the things that I often find incredibly frustrating about people who defend criminals based on their skin color, like the black criminal in this particular instance, is that they ignore the fact that the people who are most victimized, the people who have to take precautions like this, the people who often feel their security is threatened, are the law-abiding black citizens. Monique right here has to carry pepper spray in a neighborhood that used to be seen as safe due to the fact that these teens are attacking everyone. Now, we've talked about before how the knockout game, they tend to not target other black people, but these are violent people within the community. They are committing robberies, and as I said earlier in this video, we don't know for sure if all of these attacks can be attributed to these suspects. I'll try to just be alert, um, kind of be smart about my surroundings and everything. Now, this this girl right here kind of made me laugh because you have Monique keeping it real. You have her talking about how she's carrying the pepper spray. She's going to blast somebody in the face that comes up to her. But then she's happy to be on TV. She's like, I guess I'll be more aware of my surroundings. And uh, thank you guys for having me on. She seems like she's having a great day. And honestly, normally I would say you're not bringing up your energy to match the situation. But sometimes people are just happy to be on television. Let, 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 let's be honest about that. Please say the culprits are as young as 14 and neighbors are urging anyone who knows them to speak up. Now, the police are saying that these suspects are as young as 14. This is unsurprising. Like we said, your peak offending years in terms of being a criminal, especially as a male, are ages 14 to 24. But we also get this wonderful note from another resident in the area who says if it was her son, she would be screaming. She would bring him to justice. And I absolutely love that energy. Anybody knows something should say something. I swear to God, if that was my kid, I'd be on the news like screaming. I'd be screaming like anybody say something, do something. And by the way, this is the thing. This is the attitude that many on the left and by the way, some on the right get wrong about black America. The law abiding black citizen has no tolerance for this. Sure, they might be more in favor of police reforms and some other stuff that you and I might see as bad ideas. But overall, the polling consistently shows us that 80% of black people when confronted with the defund the police question are not about it. A bunch of them want to increase the funding, but the majority position is to at least keep it the same. It was something only like 19% that actually wanted to defund the police. Yet the way the media portrays it is that letting these kids go off and never talking about their criminality and all that stuff is good for black communities as a whole. But you see people from within the community talk about how they're scared and how they would turn in their own son if he ever did something as scumbaggery as this unbelievable. This is some actual depiction of reality, something that you guys out there in the audience should take home with you before you identify the whole group of people as the problem, rather than the criminal population within that group of people that honestly gives the whole group a bad rap. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you liked this video, show them by leaving a like. Subscribe for more content. Follow me on my social media. Support me via the support links in the description of this video. This has been me talking about the knockout game Boston version. Till next time.